writers with a knack for turning complicated, mind-numbing material into fascinating yarns. He wrote his first bestseller, Liar's Poker, about his experiences as a young Wall Street bond trader when he was still in his 20s, and he has since followed up with seven more bestsellers on subjects ranging from Silicon Valley and the new, new thing to big-time sports in Moneyball and the Blind Side. His new book, called The Big Short, Inside the Doomsday Machine, comes out later this week, and it explains how some of Wall Street's finest minds managed to destroy $1.75 trillion of wealth in the subprime mortgage markets. We spent two days debriefing him at his home in California. This was an episode where capitalism was almost destroyed just by the capitalists. And in the most uh, sensational way, um, they, they were sort of destroyed by their own folly. What happened? The incentives for people on Wall Street got so screwed up that the people who work there uh, became blinded to their own long-term interests and s because their, their short-term interests were so overpowering. And so they behaved in ways that were antithetical to their own long-term interests. I'm afraid that our culture will come to the conclusion, because it's always the easy conclusion, that everybody was just a bunch of criminals. I think the story is much more interesting than that. I think it's a story of mass delusion. Lewis's forte has always been discovering little-known facts and characters that change people's perception about a story. So when he finally sat down at his computer with sacks full of research to write about this calamity, he had no interest in Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson or Ben Bernanke or the CEOs of Wall Street's big investment banks, who he believes had no clue what was going on while it was going on. He wanted to tell this story through the eyes of people who were paying attention and who knew that a financial disaster was inevitable. But there were a handful of characters who actually had seen it coming and made a fortune off of it. And, I, and there were so few of them, and there were so many people who, who had been on the other side, uh, that, I thought they, that I kind of wondered who they were and why they got themselves into that position. What they saw? What they saw. Almost more how they saw. How many people were there, do you think, in the world that understood what was going on? Between 10 and 20 investors, uh, at most. And this is from a universe of tens of thousands of people who could have conceivably made that bet. The first one to see that something was seriously amiss in the burgeoning subprime mortgage market was Dr. Michael Berry, a California physician with only one good eye. He lost the other one to cancer as a child and also suffers from Asperger's syndrome, a condition related to autism that often produces an aversion to social contact. Uncomfortable dealing with patients, Berry quit medicine and started a hedge fund in Cupertino spending most of his time in a darkened office glued to his computer screen. Beginning in 2003, he turned to something that no one else in America was doing, reading and analyzing the pools of risky subprime mortgage loans that Wall Street had been buying up and bundling into highly profitable mortgage-backed securities, which they were selling to investors around the world. I called up the prospectuses, and I read the prospectuses, and I looked at these pools. I could see the credit standards within these pools deteriorating just quarter to quarter. First How quarter could you tell that? There was essentially crappier mortgages being put into these pools, and it didn't seem investors seemed to care, and it didn't seem the ratings agencies seemed to care. Do you think many people read these, read these prospectuses? I think the lawyers that put them together, <laughs> to an extent, maybe. Do you think the executives at the big Wall Street firms who were issuing these bonds had read them? Or understood them? I don't think they read them, no. I think that uh, there were probably junior analysts that were given the task of reviewing <laughs> these, these, issue, these documents. However, I think that um, this was a profit center. Um, it was a profit center. It was something the organization wanted to do. In effect, Lewis writes, Michael Berry was doing the first real analysis of the creditworthiness of the subprime borrowers and the structure of the complicated Wall Street mortgage securities, the kind of work that was supposed to have been done by bond rating agencies like Standard & Poor's and Moody's so that investors could accurately judge their risk. What you were doing sounds to me like the job that the rating agencies should have been doing. And there's no way the ratings agencies had anywhere near the manpower to look through 
all that was being issued. Yeah, but you're one guy. And you found it. You, you would think that even if they just <laughs> looked at a sample, maybe they would have come to a realization. But By 2005, okay. Michael Berry had come to the realization that the Wall Street bond market had lost its mind. It was buying up hundreds of millions of dollars in dicey loans to unqualified buyers who were, in Michael Lewis's words, one broken refrigerator away from default. Barry concluded that the subprime market would collapse in 2007. He notices for the first time that there are pools, there's, there are mortgage bonds supported by pools of loans, and most of the loans are what are called negative amortizing interest only loans, which means that. You, the homeowner and buyer, you borrow the money, and you not only don't have to re repay your principal, you, have to, you don't even have to repay the interest. And if you just don't pay anything, they just, they just add to your loan. So and you can't lose your house. You, you, you can't lose your house, right, in theory, right? And, and so he figures we've reached the end of the road in the insanity of lending. They, they're scraping the bottom of the barrel. Now is the time to lay a bet. It's before anybody does. Barry figured out that these mortgage-backed securities would become worthless if just a small percentage of the dicey loans went bad, and he wanted to bet against the worst of them. He decided that the best way to do it would be to get Wall Street to sell him inexpensive insurance contracts on the securities that would pay off big time if they failed. The contracts were called credit default swaps. He conceives that they are going to invent on Wall Street credit default swaps on subprime mortgages, essentially insurance contracts on the bonds, before they even do. And he helps, he participates in the creation of this instrument. And Michael Berry is the first one in. Berry assumed a lot of people would figure out what he was up to, but very few did. It took two years for the drama to play out, but the subprime mortgage market finally collapsed in 2007, just as he had predicted. So you made a ton of money made a ton of money much more than I ever imagined you know I'd ever have we made 725 million I think on the funds in 2007 Michael Berry's advantage was he wasn't part of the collective he was that he was just this guy in a t-shirt and shorts with a glass eyeball and Asperger syndrome uh, looking at the numbers and uh, when nobody else really was how can they not look at the numbers I mean, how can Wall Street be selling all of these, buying all of these mortgages and repackaging them and, and not realizing that they're not very good mortgages? Wall Street is able to dilute itself uh, because it's paid to dilute itself. That's the, I mean, one of the lessons of this story is that people see what they're incentivized to see. Uh, if you pay someone not to see the truth, they will not see the truth. And Wall Street organized itself so people were paid to see something other than the truth. And that's one of the central messages of the story. You have to be very careful with how you incentivize people because they will respond to the incentives. And all of the incentives in Wall Street's largely unregulated bond market were geared toward keeping the subprime money machine humming. Shortly after Michael Berry decided the people there had lost their minds, Wall Street's most influential investment bank convinced the Financial Products Division of insurance giant AIG to join the party, a decision that would destroy the company. They insured tens of billions of dollars of subprime mortgage loans without even knowing they were doing it. Goldman Sachs persuaded them to insure these piles of loans without them ever investigating what was in the pile. So there's an additional level of incompetence. They didn't even know the mistake they were making. Over a period of just a few months in 2005, Goldman Sachs got AIG to insure $20 billion worth of subprime mortgage securities that the rating agencies had graded AAA. But in fact, Lewis says, the pool worst dreck on the market. Do you think the big banks like Goldman Sachs played AIG for a patsy? That's exactly what they did. I mean, I, don't, I, don't, I think even Goldman Sachs would, would admit that to themselves. Uh, which is saying something. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, using the cover of we're all big boys in this market, uh, they, the, the big investment banks, have long uh, sought to exploit their customers. What role did the rating agencies play in this? They were handmaidens to Wall Street. The, the ratings agencies get paid by Wall Street, by Merrill Lynch, by Citigroup, by Morgan Stanley, by Goldman Sachs, to rate the bonds that Wall Street creates. 
this creates a certain moral hazard. <laughs> you write in the book that Goldman essentially took the worst stuff that they couldn't sell, they repackaged it and took it to Moody's and got Moody's to rate it AAA? Correct. How? How did, did they know that Moody's was going to rate it AAA? Yes. They had helped design the models, I'm sure, that Moody's used to rate the bonds. And I've spoken with people at Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs who said we helped the ratings agencies understand these things. They were the educators. Yeah, they were the educators. Lewis calls the Goldman Sachs AIG deal one of the original sins of the looming financial crisis. Other Wall Street firms were so jealous of the Goldman deal, they got AIG to insure another $30 billion of what turned out to be worthless securities. But Lewis thinks the fiasco had more to do with Wall Street's stupidity than corruption. They didn't understand these things. Not well enough. They, they um, uh, I mean, there's a wonderful little vignette in, in The Big Short about the leading bond trader, subprime mortgage bond trader at Morgan Stanley, a fellow named Howie Hubler, who manages to lose somewhere between, it's hard to know, but seven and $12 billion in a matter of, of six or eight months, more than any single trader has ever lost in the history of Wall Street, and no one knows his name. According to Lewis, at the end of 2006 and the beginning of 2007, when the commercial bank, J.P. Morgan, became the first to recognize the danger and fled the subprime market, Hubler was gobbling up $16 billion worth of subprime mortgage bonds that would be worthless in nine months. He did not understand the forces at work in his own market. And he is supposed to be the smart guy. I mean, what, what were the dumb guys doing? So I, I think that it's really clear that, um, that the firms themselves did not understand the machine they created. What happened to Howie Hubler? He's allowed to resign from Morgan Stanley. Uh, and he takes with him millions of dollars in back pay, tens of millions of dollars in back pay. That it was all hushed up, basically. Did most of the people who made these terrible decisions leave with a lot of money? Yes, they all did. I, I did not. I've run across a single character who didn't get rich. Anybody above a certain level in all these firms made huge sums of money by any standard. Uh, and the people who were, I mean, this is where it gets a little creepy. The people who were most instrumental in building the subprime mortgage machine also happen to be the ones who have the most detailed understanding now of the securities in the rubble. And they're being paid all over again to sort through the mess because they are the experts. That is an age-old uh, trick on Wall Street, just generally speaking. People who create disasters make a lot of money cleaning up the disaster because they're the ones who know about the disaster. What about the CEOs? From Stan O'Neill at uh, Merrill Lynch and, and Chuck Prince at Citigroup uh, are the most obvious uh, uh, examples. But, but they're paid not tens but into the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to run their firms into the ground. By the fall of 2008, with AIG and all of the big investment banks at some risk of going under, the government stepped in to bail out the very firms that had caused the crisis. A decision was made that AIG was too big to let fail, and that its gambling debts would be paid off 100 cents on the dollar, and the company that benefited the most was Goldman Sachs. Do you believe it had anything to do with their political connections? Uh, it's hard to know. There's no proof, but it certainly didn't hurt. It certainly didn't hurt that the Secretary of the Treasury was a former Goldman CEO. It certainly didn't hurt that a lot of people at the table were former Goldman employees. Uh, it certainly didn't hurt that the air they everybody breathed uh, contained the assumption that we can never do anything to harm Goldman Sachs. Uh, so, sure, I mean, I, I can't really see how their political influence... Uh, uh, didn't have anything to do with it. Wall Street's bad bets nearly brought down the financial system in 2008. One thing that didn't end, Michael Lewis says, was the bonus culture and the sense of entitlement in the financial industry. According to the New York State Comptroller, Wall Street employees split $20 billion in bonuses for 2009. That's up 17% over last year, but it's not a record. In fact, it's a third less than the $33 billion Wall Street divided up in 2007, the same year everyone on Wall Street began to acknowledge the subprime mortgage losses that would reach $1.75 trillion. 
The size of the bonuses has left Michael Lewis appalled, but not really surprised. Solomon Brothers. More than 20 years ago, Lewis collected a couple of bonuses himself as a young trader at Solomon Brothers, and he still can't figure out what he did to deserve them. I got my Wall Street bonus, in I got two bonuses in 1986 and 1987, and it was like winning the lottery. It was, the money was so shocking, even though it seems in retrospect so quaint. It was a couple of hundred thousand dollars, but I was 24, 25 years old. It was incredible that someone was going to give me a couple of hundred thousand dollars for what I'd just done, because I couldn't figure out what was so terribly useful about what I'd just done. And Lewis feels the same way about the latest round of bonuses that were paid out on $55 billion of Wall Street profits that he thinks wouldn't have been made without help from Uncle Sam. Once the government decided the banks were too important to fail, Lewis says the only way to get them back on their feet was to give them money. I think they assumed that in response for this gift of life that they were giving these Wall Street firms, the people who ran the Wall Street firms would behave responsibly in a way that didn't attract the Meaning attention. what? Meaning, Meaning not pay themselves huge sums of money. But perhaps not even pay themselves anything. Just say thank you uh, um, and rejigger their compensation systems. Instead, they did not. Instead, they used the market as an excuse for paying themselves. If we don't pay our employees of Goldman Sachs huge sums of money, they're going to leave and go to J.P. Morgan. And the J.P. Morgan people say, well, if we don't pay these special people huge sums of money, they're going to leave and go to Goldman Sachs. And, uh, and you, you kind of want to back away from it and say, well, wait a minute. Why are they so valuable in the first place? And really what's going on is the people at the top of the firm want to make a lot of money. And if they're going to make a lot of money, they've got to pay the people under them a lot of money. Uh, so it's a very elegant form of theft right now. Well, their argument has been, look, we're entitled to these bonuses this year because we made all of this money. You know, one ever asked them, they ever explain how they made all this money. Uh, if you look at their businesses right now, they're heavily government dependent. That if you were uh, uh, at Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or J.P. Morgan, you have access to a 0% loan in virtually unlimited quantities from the Federal Reserve. You can take that money and reinvest it in treasury bonds or in, in, in uh, government agency securities, and you will get the spread. And you could, you could do it over and over. You're essentially borrowing from the government and lending to the government and taking, out, taking a cut. Uh, and so the government's let them make the, the money. Well, the government is still subsidizing these firms because the losses were sensational. I mean, in the financial system, there are now $1.75 trillion of losses from the subprime mortgage bonanza. And that's, uh, they're firms that really, they, look, they really shouldn't exist. If the market had been allowed to function, they would not exist. They'd be failed enterprises. I mean, even now, if the government said, we have nothing to do with these places anymore, we're going to let them fail if they fail, they no longer have this effective government guarantee, and by the way, we're going to cut out these subsidies that we're, that we're handing them under the table, most of them would fail. But none of that has changed the Wall Street bonus culture. Lewis says there is a sense of entitlement to outrageous compensation that he thinks is way out of proportion to its contribution to the U.S. economy. How did that happen? That somebody thinks they're worth automatically millions of dollars a year? Well, when you're surrounded by a lot of other people who are being paid millions of dollars a year, uh, you, you're not thinking, oh, it's outrageous for someone to pay me millions of dollars a year. You're thinking, it's outrageous that Jim got five hundred thousand dollars more than me that they, they are they're looking to each other as reference points rather than to the larger society are they worth that kind of money what do you mean are they worth that kind of money do they deserve all that money uh, again what do you mean do they deserve it do they did they they worked really hard they spent a lot of hours in the office so uh, you can't begrudge someone who starts a company and employs lots of people and so on and so forth